Good afternoon, participants. It is my great pleasure to welcome this distinguished lady, this distinguished professor of science, um, Professor Caitlin Malfleet. She is the first dean of her university in history, the first female dean of her university in history. She is a lecturer, a professor, she is an ex-law student, she is um, or was the, the, the president of the EU Women's Commission. Oh no, the Flemish Council Flemish. of Women. Sorry, I've got EU so much EU, EU and Africa in my head. <laughs> <laughs> she is the president of the Flemish Council of Women. She is a pleasure to listen to. She is a pleasure to be in the presence of. And I would like you to give a big, warm ICD welcome to Professor Caitlin Malfleet. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, um, what has not been said, but what is very important for this lecture, is that before becoming a dean, I was involved for decades in the study of uh, Eastern Europe and Russia. So I studied uh, communism, I studied uh, politics and law in Central and Eastern Europe, and uh, first of all in uh, the Soviet Union. Uh, so, and that is what I want to share with you today when we talk about um, human rights. Uh, I would like to discuss with you what exactly changed in the field of the human rights discussion after the fall of the Berlin Wall, after um, the end of the Cold War, of course, uh, and after the implosion of the Soviet Union. Uh, Europe has changed a lot, of course, after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, we talked, and we still talk, about Europe when we have in mind the European Union, when we have in mind Western Europe. But that is not true any longer. Uh, Europe has enlarged, and the concept of Europe is, uh, has changed uh, geographically. Uh, when we talk of Europe today, we should not equalize it anymore with Western Europe. Europe is, uh, again, geographically, that continent that goes to, to the Urals, indeed. So a new concept, well, it's not new, of course, uh, the continent of Europe is really reaching to, towards the Urals, which means that also Russia is partially, at least, Europe. Um, so Europe has changed its geographical uh, concept, but also uh, its uh, identity. Its identity, and there uh, the rights discussion uh, comes in. Uh, I think it's very important important for the future of Europe in which sense that rights discussion will develop. Um, I uh, gave uh, uh, the title Freedom, Equality and Solidarity. So it is the slogan of the French Revolution. Yeah? Um, um, so the freedom, uh, la liberté, uh, uh, legality, equality, and fraternity, brotherhood, but also solidarity. And I, I still think at this moment that uh, the balance between those three concepts, freedom on the one hand, equality on the other, and solidarity as perhaps trying to balance those two uh, is a major requirement for the future of the rights discussion uh, in Europe. But let's start with um, what happened during the Cold War, 
during that period that East and West were divided and uh, we had a Western Europe that was uh, helped by the US with a Marshall Plan first after the Second World War and uh, afterwards, of course, uh, there was NATO uh, really guaranteeing Europe with a defense identity that was enormously important for Europe. Uh, a democratic Western Europe and uh, an Eastern part of Europe that was communist and uh, that was protected uh, in its uh, security by the Warsaw Pact. Now, the rights discussion was very important during that Cold War period. The West had a completely different idea of what rights were than the East. And you should really take that in mind that uh, the so-called communist uh, ideology and political choice was really an alternative to that West European democratic uh, approach. So um, the communism, of course, has never been realized. Yeah? Uh, that is, uh, it never happened. We talk about really existing socialism that uh, was uh, there, especially in Central Europe, uh, when you talk about uh, Poland, Hungary, and so on. Um, certainly people did not uh, accept that communism was the political system, it was the really existing socialism, a political mo model that was indeed a, an alternative to that um, West European. Uh, in which sense? Well, um, the rights in Western Europe were seen as a, a place of non-interference by the state. So the state had to take off. That was the liberal interpretation of the rights in Western Europe. Uh, the fact that um, the state could not interfere in uh, the freedoms of individuals, uh, the idea of liberties was an idea of negative rights. Yeah? You could just exclude the state and everyone else from your personal individual uh, freedom. That was the idea of the liberal rights in Western Europe. The idea was also that you really could claim those rights uh, from uh, the uh, judge, uh, you really could make them through, uh, through a, a procedure before the judge. The Eastern uh, approach to rights was completely different. Uh, the idea was that a person was born naked, without rights, and that uh, the person through uh, the uh, increasing production of the state, would acquire more economic and social rights in the first place. So it was not about political and civil rights. That was certainly not stressed in Eastern Europe. It was about social and economic rights. And so really existing socialism claimed that they were better as systems in bringing social and economic rights, social protection also, to the people better than the West European systems. They would do so by increasing their production and uh, coming to a common aim, uh, better product productivity and more um, uh, well, more economic and social rights for the people. Now, this has proven to be wrong. That is clear. Eh? This has proven to be wrong because those systems 
the assumption there was that people were already communist people that were denying their selfish aims and their selfish ideas about uh, their lives and going for that common aim, which is not true, of course. People are, uh, first of all, interested in their own gains. And this is something that should be taken with when you talk about public policy. Yeah? Public policy is about uh, taking into account the individual interests of people and uh, bringing those individual interests together in order uh, to make people, uh, taking into account their individual interest, to make people uh, having a certain solidarity in uh, uh, society. Yeah? Uh, these are old ideas that come from Roman law. Um, von Gehring, for example, Rudolf von Gehring, was already uh, claiming that kind of public policy uh, when he talked about uh, uh, Der Kampf ums Recht um, in a book uh, where he uh, really try to say, well, if we talk about law, we should take into account the individual interests of um, people. So, my first idea is there were two systems about rights and they were completely uh, opposed to each other. Yeah? On the one hand, the West European liberal uh, rights uh, the idea of the individual protecting himself or herself against the state, the idea of political and civil rights in the first place, um, the idea of uh, being able to really uh, ask the judge to protect uh, the person uh, in uh, his or her rights. And on the other hand, you had the East, with economic and social rights, with a completely different way of looking at rights um, being given to a person. Social and economic rights, political rights were only there um, in a functional way to sustain the building of communism. So you could go on the street, you could indeed protest, but it should be in order to build communism. So that was the idea of political rights. You could go uh, uh, for a manifestation, but that manifestation should be pro-communist uh, and not against um, communism. And then you see indeed what the dissidents did at that moment. Uh, they asked the state to really become democratic in a sense that political and civil rights would be respected. That was the claim of the dissidents in the uh, 70s, the idea uh, to ask the state to respect um, the political and civil rights. They did not talk about social and economic rights because that was not the problem at that, at that moment. And then in 89, you have the fall of the Berlin Wall and the implosion of the Soviet Union in 91. And at that moment, the whole picture in the rights discussion changed in a very drastic way. I would say in a Copernican way. It was really a completely different um, picture that we have about the rights discussion at that moment. Um, the whole idea of really existing uh, socialism collapsed. Communism disappeared, as you know, and all the countries in Central and Eastern Europe started to talk the language of the West European liberal rights. Yeah. That is what you can see in the new legislations that appeared after uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall. You see it in Central Europe, but you see it also in the former Yugoslavia, 
even in, in countries as Albania, for example, you see it in uh, Russia and in the CIS. Everywhere, constitutions were changed, laws were changed in order to bring them in um, a formulation that is the formulation of liberal rights, liberal democratic rights as we know them in um, Western Europe. That is what happened immediately after the fall of uh, communism. And do not understand me right. Of course, this was a very good thing. Because those societies were totalitarian societies, completely dominated by the Communist Party, by that ideology of Marxism, Leninism, uh, which really um, took the freedom of people away. So this was a good thing. People became free from that totalitarian system. And that was certainly a good thing. But what I want to share with you is that something else happened which was not so good for um, Eastern Europe, but also not for Western Europe. And that is something that is not seen that clearly um, by people, even by people who are involved in the study of uh, European law or um, human rights. Um, Something happened when the post-communist countries changed their legislation into uh, a complete adaptation to uh, liberal rights. Uh, and that is that um, it was not only liberal democracy in a political uh, understanding that came to Eastern Europe. It was not only about political rights, freedom of expression, uh, freedom of communication. This indeed improved and was a good thing. Yeah? Freedom of uh, election, uh, a pluriparty system, and so on. All these were very important improvements, but what came in also was a liberal economic interpretation of rights. That was very important. And what do you see happening then? And it came very slowly but surely. The first marks that I see date already from 75, when the Helsinki conference was concluded in 75 with those three baskets, you know, uh, um, the military basket, the economic, technological basket, and then the human rights basket. Uh, and they were seen as communicating vessels. So if there was improvement in human rights, there was also improvement in uh, economic and technological cooperation. Uh, um, this was the first sign where you could see that this liberal economic interpretation of human rights came in. Because uh, you had that military basket, it was about uh, arms reduction and so on. You had the economic technological basket, it was about transfer of technology to the um, socialist countries because they were far behind already in 75 with uh, the Western, compared to the Western countries. So they needed technology transfer. And then you had that human rights basket where the West said, well, you have to respect human rights. Otherwise, you don't get the economic um, uh, and technological transfer from us. That's what I call um, uh, communicating vessels. So if the one goes up, the other goes up uh, as well. That was the idea. But in the economic basket, this was really, it was called a hymn to the market organization and market principles. So already with the Helsinki agreements of the OSCE, 
then it was the conference uh, still, um, with those principles, liberal economic thinking came in. And then you can ask yourself, why did the Soviet Union accept this kind of approach? Why did the Soviet, Soviet Union accept market organization as a principle in those Helsinki principles when they were fully engaged in a planned economy? Well, this was because at that moment, uh, the Soviet Union had a very dualistic idea about international law. So they uh, could perfectly accept market principles at the international level and have their planned economy at their national level. That was in their dualistic uh, idea, was perfectly uh, workable. But once again, this kind of liberal thinking, which uh, leads to capitalism as a principle, came in uh, in the dialogue with Eastern Europe. It came in in 75 in a first step, but it was certainly um, more focused on even and more explicit when the rights discussion came up uh, in the framework of the OSCE with the documents of Copenhagen of 1990 and uh, the OSCE Charter for a New Europe. Yeah. The OSCE Charter for a New Europe um, very clearly makes the choice for what they call a unique concept of human rights meaning that they take political and civil rights and social and economic rights as a unique concept of human rights. Yeah? After uh, the, um, um, the famous pacts of the 60s, UN pacts uh, with political and civil rights on the one hand and the economic and social rights on the other, uh, the Charter for a New Europe says well, we talk about a unique concept of human rights. Um, and we would like to surpass, to overcome that division between East and West about political rights on the one hand and economic and social uh, rights on the other hand. But by doing this, a liberal economic approach to human rights came in. Yeah? And it came in um, through several channels, through the OSCE, as I told already, but it came in also through IMF, World Bank, EBRD. The Washington consensus is all about bringing in market principles uh, uh, into that human rights discussion, uh, the idea that freedom leads to economic freedom in very, very far-reaching forms, capitalism, as a matter of fact. Yeah? Um, this is John Locke. Yeah? This is John Locke as a philosopher. This is John Locke. It's really about you are free to accumulate your uh, gains from work and uh, to do that in a very extreme form that leads to capitalism. And who took that idea of economic liberalism in Central and Eastern Europe? It was a very small elite, as you all know, it was a very small elite. In Russia, they are called the oligarchs. Uh, a, a, a person as Abramovich, we know all. Uh, he is active. We talked about football and economic power uh, before. Well, all this is happening indeed. Uh, um, so uh, there is that idea of uh, no hindrance anymore for becoming rich after communism. Uh, uh, being legitimated to accumulate 
property and the rights of workers not being protected that well anymore. What I see in Hungary, for example, and in Poland, is that people at the end of communism uh, were quite developed in their rights to um, have uh, participation in uh, enterprises and in uh, 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 workers' councils and so on. All this has been taken away by the privatization, so it is not always so positive uh, the way uh, things have, uh, have changed. Once again, there are also very positive things, so don't take me too negatively, but I, I, I want to uh, really point at the fact that um, the future of Europe is about the future of capitalism. Because the wild capitalism that is developing in Eastern Europe, legitimated by a human rights discourse, imagine. Why? Because it is about the freedom of property rights. It is about the uh, right to have property and to um, uh, do with that property whatever uh, you want. But property as a basis for individual liberty is something else. And that is the human right of property. It is the right indeed to have property as a basis for individual liberty. Who is using that property um, concept, that liberal con uh, property concept? Legal persons, multinationals are using that kind of uh, liberal property rights, uh, the oligarchs are using that kind of individual uh, property right. But what about uh, the masses of people? What about the workers? What about the women as well? All this, I have to say this, all these very important aspects of human rights are not guaranteed by law in Europe. Why? Because the nice ideas that we have about stakeholdership, for example, it's a very nice idea, eh? you have shareholdership on the one hand uh, in corporate governance and uh, on the other hand you have stakeholdership, meaning that others can indeed claim that they have an interest in an enterprise, for example, which is not a property rights interest. So that stakeholdership, well, it's not really that well guaranteed. Eh? Um, the idea of social, of um, corporate social governance, which is so important for uh, having multinationals behave ethically, it's not really well developed in law. Yeah? It's not the case. The ideas are there, but the law is very slow in uh, uh, just um, uh, following that idea of what I would call taking rights seriously. Yeah? Taking rights seriously, it's a, it's a work of uh, Dworkin. Yeah? Uh, the idea that it's not so easy anymore to talk about the socialist interpretation of human rights on the one hand and the conservative interpretation on the other hand uh, or the social democratic and so on. No, it is about um, just, uh, you know, having those rights redefined. Yes, yes, I will stop. Uh, <laughs> Ah, yeah, yeah, but we will have uh, uh, some room for discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, I can go on and on, but I think, I think that I made my point here. Um, the idea that, uh, well, we saw, for example, in, in uh, the right to express uh, uh, yourself as well, there is improvement on the one hand. There are rights to uh, just express your thought, whatever you want. But there is a new censorship coming up. It's the censorship of uh, media ownership property. The idea of self-censorship 
of the media the fact that they can say whatever they want, but that they don't have the means to really bring uh, the news uh, to, the, uh, to the people because all important mass communication uh, instruments are in the hands of an elite uh, or of the state. So uh, there, is, there are new forms of um, uh, uh, human rights violations which are much more difficult to detect because uh, in the whole Europe there is now that same talk about liberal human rights. But there is a risk that those liberal human rights become illiberal in their concrete implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Liberty, legality, and solidarity. All those three principles, some new principles and a new slant on human rights. Property as human rights. Fantastic. Thank you very much. You have deeply impacted me, and I'm going to have a look at my studies once again <laughs> and my research. Okay, how did this lecture impact you personally? Do you agree with the concepts? Do you not agree? How are you going to take this lecture into your future lives and talk about this new concept of human rights, property? Anybody? You look expectant. <laughs> I think it's a very important uh, point that um, different theorists, you know, such as Foucault, brought up the fact that, you know, uh, actually the way we produce knowledge and our thought is historically contingent and actually our concepts maybe of what human rights is comes out of certain contexts and I think that's Im very important to remember when we're just you know throwing around these terms like human rights and development and this uh, that exist in very different ways and different contexts and I think it's very important to bring up these issues and what are the you know the social effects of conceptualizing something a certain way um, and I think you know, for me, that's a lot of what I do with my music and ideas and negotiation of dialogue and stuff. And it's more creating a condition for rights and, and creating a better way, I think, of relating to each other, of different ideologies to relate to each other so they don't, um, you know, threaten each other or cause... I, I think you know, human rights is kind of a, a, con a condition, I think, of social circumstances. Um, and so I think it's very important to bring perspectives of this out so that we don't homogenize a lot of really detailed social issues into just, you know, human rights. You know, so I, I thank you very much for bringing that up and I, it's, it's an important point in really addressing, you know, human rights in detail. We need to consider um, yep. circumstances that you were suggesting. So thank you very much. No, thank you. I, I think that indeed we have a tension between the relativist approach to human rights on the one hand and the universalist on the other when we talk about uh, development rights. Of course it's important that uh, human rights should be uh, universal and that should uh, remain our claim. On the other hand, um, we have a lot of talk about double standards and so on, so that is the relativist approach, which is important as well, to uh, bring those uh, human rights in a very special, concrete um, uh, condition. The problem is that we need so much time to explain all this, and that terms, as for example, intersectionalism and so on, are so difficult, you know, to, uh, um, uh, to understand and to explain. So it's very complex uh, and you should be able to bring it to people in a way that uh, people can understand that it's always uh, a question of what the Romans already uh, named the aurea mediocritas, so the middle way, you know, uh, between universalism and uh, uh, relativism, uh, for example. Uh, so it's, it's, it's very complex, but we need new um, uh, ideas to really be put into uh, uh, the norms as well, because the ideas are there at this moment, I think, 
but the, the normative aspects are not following those ideas. So we are still uh, in a, a kind of outdated uh, normative context. Big dilemma. On the, in, the, in the West, you have a right to live before you're even born. In the East, it doesn't seem that that right is given. Yeah. Yeah. Um, human rights are cultural, have a very deep cultural aspect to them, as well as the definitions that, um, Professor, you have just placed. Any more comments? Thank you. Like, I have the feeling that I will be leaving Berlin with more questions than answers, and it's a really pleasant feeling. <laughs> and I, okay, all more questions, maybe. And I thank you, Professor, because like you have posed like really important questions. And I will like say what you have explained as back to my country, I'm from Italy, and my country is both projected towards Africa and towards the East. So I'm pretty sensitive in, like, in these issues. And I thank you for having explained us, have shed a light on the remote cause of the situation that we are living now. Like our lives, uh, the political arena, particularly in Italy, is really dominated by the market, economic priorities. And so I thank you like, for having warned us all about like, this contradiction and the lack of legal protection of our rights from like the capitalist, the world capitalist interference in our lives. So I really appreciate what you have just explained us. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, for example, the right to participate is a right that should find its legal expression more than it is at this, uh, at this moment, because that is uh, the idea of balancing political and civil and social and economic rights, the right for everyone to participate in public life, in economic life, and so on. So that should be a basic right with guarantees, minimal guarantees, I think, as well. So it, 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 it is... Um, uh, really far going and once again we are very slow in adapting our um, uh, normative system there. Uh, if you look at European Union normative um, framework, if you look at the acquis communautaire, it is following the market and very liberal in its uh, in its framework. So, um, uh, of course this is not explicit because what I fully realize at this moment, uh, it was always there but not so explicit, is that European Union normative framework is about procedures, it's about the rule of law, it's about you know how to play the, the, the rules of the game. It is not about the ideological choices of countries um, it's not about ideological choices made by people and so on. That is free for everyone. But there the discussion comes in how to um, uh, guarantee in those circumstances that everyone can participate. That, that is uh, a basic problem uh, and that everyone has a minimum to live with, for example, also. Another, of course, you have to stand up for the camera. <laughs> Hi, hello. Uh, they, this may be a very targeted question, I don't know. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for bringing up the, is the issue uh, on the environment and the strife for energy in the interview. I thought it was really important. It hasn't been touched on enough. Obviously, there's not, not time for everything, yeah. in my opinion, because it, it, it shapes everything. Like the way the West influences in conflicts in the Middle East, it's, it's energy, it's like where can we get our resources from comes first and everything yeah. else comes second or third or not even yeah. in the list. And, and secondly, like, I'd, I'd like to ask you, uh, for example, like I come from Spain and in Spain we have seen like European, obviously European uh, institutions have asked us for like uh, measures of cuts in spending and everything for the, to obviously balance out our debt. And we've seen uh, our health system 
has been uh, now we have to pay for certain things, uh, like uh, protests. Some protests have been banned. The right to freedom of expression has been banned. Obviously, as a balance with it, b between the stability of the country, the keeping running the country with the protests, because people just used to camp in the middle of Madrid for ages and nothing was happening. Mm -hmm. So, like people, people, what we strive to achieve the free, like free NHS, or whatever you call it, like freedom of expression, all of this. We are, like what Spanish people feel is we're taking a step back. We still have those rights, obviously. You, but how, where, like, where is the line? What is a right? Like, do Western countries need to take a step back and say, the, this is a right, but our version of the right is too privileged? Do we need to take a step back for other people who have less rights to take a step forward? Yeah. Or can they catch up with us? I don't know if that's even a yeah, question, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's a very fundamental uh, discussion about wh what you talk you. about is the Washington con consensus coming, coming in, eh? uh, in, in, in the way governments should behave. Eh? And it comes together with uh, economic and budgetary problems and international organizations saying, well, if you want to be uh, helped, in this way, you should agree with the liberal economic um, idea of uh, budget cutting and so on and so on. So that is what I mean by the, by the, the, the Washington uh, consensus, which is really having an impact on each of us uh, and on our freedom as well, or the guarantees, the economic guarantees for um, our, uh, our freedom. Um, so this is changing at the moment that economic problems come and uh, the question is how can you free when you are hungry? Eh? Uh, how uh, can you realize freedom when uh, there is not enough uh, for everyone? And there I would say that the Central and East European countries coming from that really existing socialism have, and research proves that, have a higher expectance, uh, expectancy towards social protection by the state than the West European uh, countries. So they even have a higher expectation about the uh, state protecting them uh, in their social security. That is very clear. So, um, my colleagues from uh, the University of Brussels, for example, do research on more trade unions and so on, and social uh, guarantees in Central Europe. And they claim that even in Central Europe, at this moment, this uh, problem with social protection that is taken away from people uh, well, it's already 20 years after the fall of the, more than 20 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall. But this idea of, um, uh, you know, being deprived of social protection is creating there, they call it a social Hiroshima. So it's not my words, eh? uh, they come from my colleagues uh, of Brussels University. But I think that this um, of course, for the future of Europe, it's very important because the European Union never engaged in uh, problems of social policy and social protection. It was left to the, uh, to the member states, as you know. That was not their, their idea. Uh, and this will not be sustainable in the future. That is clear. Thank you very much. Time has far spent done now. <laughs> I, I gotta say something. Okay. You know, <laughs> I'm, wait, I'm gonna be brief. Uh, you know, I'm from Detroit, Michigan, which is a, a workers' city. It's an industrial center, or was, and it's in total collapse now. But uh, a lot of the people there, and maybe people here don't know this, but the United States had a bigger Communist Party than 
Russia in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Communism is an idea. If I call myself an elephant, that doesn't make me an elephant. If you call yourself a humanist, mm. that doesn't just make you one. It's also a question of D. So people can misuse different ideas and what have you. What bothers me, what disturbs me in the presentations, and to some degree in your presentation, is this, la this, this, this necessary lambasting of this idea without kind of like expressing what does that idea represent. Now, I mentioned the Communist Manifesto, and, and I just kind of like went over some of the points while the discussion was going on earlier. And it is a document which describes a certain social and economic and political situation and uh, indicts a system. Mm -hmm. There's no other document like that in literature. Especially, and, and there is no document from the capitalist. There is none. There is no capitalist manifesto <laughs> at all. So, yes, I know, five seconds, that, that is, not five minutes. And <laughs> so... John Locke is a capitalist yeah, manifesto. Yeah. So, well, uh, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that in most of these presentations, when people talk about democracy, it's strangely devoid of the misery and the, you know, and the degradation that black people in America suffered the indigenous populations. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, you're upholding the system. Now, I'm not talking directly to you, excuse me. I'm not putting you on front street. No, 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 I'm just no, talking no, in general. No, no. And, and, and on That's the one hand. I, I always say to my students first read the Communist Manifesto. Oh, good. Because they, <laughs> they have no knowledge about that. They are last right. year students eh, right. of the law faculty okay. and political science. Let, let me just. They didn't read it. I say, read it first. It's basic. Let me just sum up my, my, just my, what I wanted to say. All along the line here, people have been upholding this system, this, this foggy system of democracy, when it violates every human right mm -hmm. over centuries. And then it lambasts another system that tries to, or idea that tries to challenge it. Yeah. I'm trying to understand the logic behind that. I think, yeah. excuse me, would you like to retort? Or? Well, I, I think he's absolutely right. Eh? Uh, th that is the idea that all this is not sustainable anymore, and that is good perhaps for the future, because that becomes now, finally, very clear. That's what I, I, uh, uh, I wanted to say when I talked about illiberal democracy. That is a, a democracy that doesn't lead to the freedom of people uh, and uh, protection of human rights, but to something else. Uh, so but that idea is rather new as accepted um, in a scientific world, even uh, the idea of illiberal democracy. Uh, it's not so that democracy frees people as such. Yeah. I think the title of the lecture uh, begs the question, how universal are human rights? And I think the answer is, they are not. And that is why we exist, the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, to promote basic human rights and stability throughout the world. You know, the thing is that I'm from Georgia, and uh, you may know that your lecture was uh, so emotional for me because the uh, Soviet Union was, uh, if I had faced it firsthand, my parents faced it firsthand and uh, the parents of my parents. So um, the things that I want to say, uh, it's not so easy as we talk that Soviet Union collapsed and uh, then we went and turned into um, Western politics. It wasn't so easy because- Words, <laughs> words in constitutions. Uh, yeah. That's what I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, words, yes, yeah. but many people died of course for this. Not the, policy, yeah? the yeah. concepts, freedom, equality, and solidarity yeah. are the concept that we are now uh, imagining what this is. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Nice note to end. Um, a big round of applause for Professor Caitlin Manfredic. Thank you very much.